All right, everybody, we'll get started and we'll have some more people I'm sure will join us as we get going. But I do want to welcome you all to our public meeting on the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. I am so excited to see that you all are interested in learning more about the plan and we are really looking forward to having a good discussion with you about this draft and really talk about the future of transportation in our region. So I'll start off with some introductions of your three speakers today. Um, I am Lisa Hood. I'm the Public Engagement Specialist for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. And I'll have Jacob, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Jacob Rieger. I'm the Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. And Alvin. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Alvin Villat Sanchez, and I'm a transportation planner here with Dr. Cog. All right. So the three of us are going to give you a presentation today. So here's what's on deck for this meeting. We're gonna give about a 30 to maybe 40 minute presentation about um, the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. We'll all go also give a brief background on what Dr. Cog is and how we developed the plan. We'll really highlight some of the main priorities in the plan. And then throughout that whole presentation, we'll also be kind of sprinkling in some interactive polling just to keep these virtual meetings a bit more engaging. But then we do want to keep um, as much time as possible for discussion and to hear your questions and be able to answer your questions about the plan. So a good chunk of the meeting will be devoted to that discussion and Q&A. Uh, understand everybody has lots of meetings to go to, busy lives. So if you, if you feel like all you want to do is hear the presentation and you want to jump off before the discussion, feel free to do that. Or if you want to stay with us for the full hour and a half, we are really looking forward to that discussion and Q&A part as well. So I want to start off with um, just some background about Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Other than being a really great acronym, we are the, a quasi-governmental um, public agency devoted to working together with all of the local governments within the region. So we come together regionally to discuss all of these issues that really cross the boundaries of uh, the diff various different municipalities. So we're made up of 58 member, member governments. So those are cities and counties within the uh, Dr. Cog area that you see in this map. And we tackle a bunch of different issues, um, aging, environment, regional growth, and transportation. And so today we're talking about the transportation function of Dr. Cog. And we, instead of, there will be quite a few slides in this presentation. So um, in the interest of trying uh, to make it a bit more interactive, we created this introductory video about the Regional Transportation Plan, which I just love and I think it's a really great way to kind of kick off um, this discussion about the plan. So if you guys are okay with me trying my virtual skills with playing a video, um, that is what we will do. It's only about a minute and a half. So give me a second to share the correct screen and then we'll watch that video to kind of kick things off. And let me know once I start playing it if you can't hear it or can't see it. We're always on the go, walking, driving, biking. We all have places to be, but how often do we stop to think about everything that makes it possible to get where we need to go? Adding transit lines, constructing and fixing roads, creating bike paths, all these things make it possible for us to move around the region. They help us connect to the world around us, whether we're going to the grocery store, our jobs or school, to visit with family and friends, or to explore nature. As our region continues growing, we simply can't take for granted that our current infrastructure and systems will always be able to support our population. The Denver Regional Council of Governments brings community leaders together from across 10 counties to decide how our region funds and prioritizes transportation investments. The Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan looks ahead to 2050 so we can prepare for our population's continued growth over the next 30 years. The plan anticipates the region's needs and we're involving residents to learn how we can meet those needs from expanding our public transportation network to improving our roadways to making biking and walking safer and more accessible. 
Learn more about the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and how you can shape the future of transportation. All right, so I think that's a good kind of foundation setting video to watch because I think it really tells the story about why we do this regional transportation plan and really what the intent of this plan is. So I'm gonna get back to my slides. Um, just one second. All right, so I wanted to kick this off. We're really excited that you are taking time out of your day to attend this meeting and we are really looking forward to getting your feedback in the meeting. Um, but I did want to let you know that there are lots of other opportunities to give input if you feel like you really want to dig into the whole 180 pages of the plan and provide detailed feedback on each page, there is an option for that. So um, just want to make sure you know that there's lots of opportunities to give input in addition to this meeting. Um, kind of starting it off, the draft plan was released last Friday, Friday the 12th, um, and then it is open right now for public review until we have a public hearing on March 17th. So we've got a good amount of time to review the draft. Um, because obviously you're interested in this enough to be in the meeting, I hope to also inspire you to spread the word to your contacts, maybe people that don't know that there's a regional transportation plan or that it's open for public review right now. Um, would love it if you could help spread the word. Um, if you're a local government staff person and you could help spread the word to your local government or your communities, that would be great as well. We're kind of in this fourth phase of the plan. So the plan kicked off in summer of 2019, and now we're at that draft plan review phase. So I mentioned that there's a lot of other opportunities for input um, in addition to this meeting. We, in the interest of trying to create as many op options for people as possible in this odd COVID environment, um, we created an on-demand virtual open house, which is really a website where people can dig in and learn as much or as little about the plan as they'd like and provide feedback in a variety of different ways. And I'll talk more about that um, kind of towards the end of our presentation. We have these virtual public meetings going on, which you are at. We've developed an interactive map so that people can really dive in and see more detail about all the projects that are in the plan, their funding and timelines and things like that. And then just generally, it's open for public comment. Um, until March 17th, like I mentioned, when we have the public hearing in front of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, which the board is made up of city council members and county commissioners who represent each of those local governments that I mentioned. So I mentioned that we're going to do some interactive polling to keep this virtual meeting interesting. We aren't going to start the um, official questions yet, but I want to get us started, um, get you set up to, to start doing those polling questions when you get to that part of the presentation. So. Some of you may have used this tool called Mentimeter before. Um, and what it is, is an interactive polling um, functionality. So the way that you participate, if you'd like to today, is you would go to www.menti.com. And you can do this either, you can open another screen on whatever um, uh, computer that you're using, or if you have a smartphone, you can also use that to to join it and then it's going to ask you for a code and the code is 1343138 and I believe uh, we're also throwing that in the chat if you want to just get that direct link there or if you're QR code savvy you can also use the QR code um, but that will get you into the questions and then we'll, we're going to start it off with just a couple fun questions to just give you kind of the feel of how this works before we get into the more meat of the questions. And you'll see at the top, the, that link in that code will stay at the top whenever we're on these polling slides. So I love trivia and I love Colorado. So here's our uh, trivia question about Colorado. Which of these fun facts about Colorado is not true? And this is just a good example of how the kind of multiple choice polling questions work. The options are the road to Mount Evans is the highest paid road, paved road in North America. Colorado has the most national parks of any state. No US president or vice president has been born in Colorado, or Colfax Avenue is the longest continuous street in America. So three truths and a lie about Colorado. Which one is the lie? And then you guys kind of see the point that once your vote goes in, you can see it pop up on the screen. 
All right, and it looks like we've at least got a vote for each one of them, but there, the 11 of you are correct. The false fact is that Colorado has the most national parks of any state. That, that honor actually goes to California, but the other three are all true about Colorado. So that gives you a good idea of the multiple choice questions. We'll also have a couple more open-ended questions. So I'll show you an example of what that would look like. So this question is, in what state or country did you grow up? And then you'll see as you enter your answer, it'll pop up on the screen. And this one is kind of does a word cloud so that the text will be bigger if we get multiple answers. So we've got multiple people from Florida, Colorado, Ohio, Massachusetts, Michigan, California, all those national parks, <laughs> Ohio, Virginia. All right, we've got a good mix. That's a good, that's a good Colorado stew right there. <laughs> All right, so that gives you a good idea of what the polling questions will be. Just leave that window open or leave that open on your smartphone. Um, and we'll get to that as we go through the presentation, more slides of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alvin to give you some more details about the plan and how it was developed. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so I'll be going through why we have an RTP, what function it plays in the region, and then some of the development steps that we've seen over the last two years of development. So our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP, is one way that we implement the region's larger guiding plan, which is Metro Vision, which uh, sets the what we want our future to look like in the region, our quality of life. As with all agencies, even pre-COVID-19, there's limited funding available for what we want to do in the region, what we need to invest in or what we, what, what we want to invest in. So we make sure that the projects and the programs we're including in the plan are what we think can reasonably occur over the next 30 years. The plan also sets the region's vision for what the multimodal transportation system look like, looks like. We're not just talking about the different components of the plan, so the road way network, the transit system, we're also talking about the impacts of the transportation system. So what do we want safety to look like in 2050? How do we want freight and goods to move around the region in 2050? Just as the RTP implements Metro Vision, we have a short range plan called the Transportation Improvement Program or the TIP, which also implements the RTP. So making sure that projects that are, projects and programs that are in the RTP get pulled into the TIP. We do an update like this every four years, and we do it with all of our partners in the region. So CDOT, RTD, as well as our local governments, our county governments, toll authorities, and other transportation providers. And then, as Lisa mentioned, we wear a lot of different hats as Dr. Cog, and one is our designation as an MPO, or the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the region. So we make sure we're checking those boxes as well. By the time we get to June, which is when we're looking for federal approval of our plan, even though it's only February, we're already looking forward to June, we'll be looking at about a two year long process to develop this plan. There have been four distinct phases, each with a public engagement component and a stakeholder engagement component. A key part of this has been that even after our plans adopted in April, hopefully, and we receive federal approval by June, we still have the opportunity to update the plan as needed so we can amend in between these four year cycles. So as conditions change or priorities change, we can change the plan with it. Over the last year and a half, we've done a lot of public engagement and whether it's been at pop-up events back in the summer of 2019 or our online surveys or our two advisory groups, we've heard consistent priorities come out of our public engagement. Those have included investing in quality transit throughout the region providing more choices for people to get around the region, being able to walk, bike, roll safely, and increasing the safety for our vulnerable users, so folk who are biking, walking, and rolling. There's been less interest in funding new roads and new highways. There's also been an interest in improving our air quality, so reducing the greenhouse gas emissions in the region. At the same time we've been doing our public engagement, we've also been meeting with our stakeholders in the region. We have a number of different avenues that we use to reach our stakeholders. We have our county transportation forums where we're able to bring together all the different local governments within the county and have a collaborative conversation with. We've been meeting regularly with CDOT and RTD. Uh, we've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with local governments as needed. And then we've also been going through our own committee and board structure here at Dr. Cog, keeping our board members, our committee members updated and getting their input and feedback as we've gone through this plan development process. In terms of what we heard from our stakeholders, there's been an interest in making sure the projects that we include in the plan are multimodal, 
and provide a regional benefit. So if we're looking at a road project, making sure that providing bicycle and pedestrian components and maybe it's improving safety. So making sure a project does a lot of different things. Going back to our county transportation forums, that's actually how we solicited projects to evaluate, to include in the plan. So when those counties did rank their projects, we included that in our evaluation. We wanted to make sure we were keeping a balance of projects across the region. So making sure investments were spread across the varied communities of our region, making sure those investments reflected the, the current unique development status of each of those communities. We also kept the uh, social equity in our minds. So how are these investments impacting low-income communities, communities of color in the region? And then similarly with the public, there was an interest in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So improving the air quality and specifically looking at how we can uh, reach the goals outlined in HB 1261 or Colorado's Climate Action Plan. I'll give some highlights of the plan, how we organized it, a high level summary of funding, and then I'll turn it over to Jacob to go into some of the nuts and bolts of each of those priorities. So using the input we received from the public and the stakeholder, we organized our plan into these six priorities, safety, air quality, regional transit, active transportation, freight, and multimodal mobility. Uh, throughout the plan, we highlighted information that was related to each of these, and we organized our investment priorities along these, these six themes as well. When it comes to funding, there's two ways to look at it. Uh, first, there's the overall amount that we think can be spent in the region out to 2050. So that's all the funding we think will be spent on the transportation system by all the different parties. So local governments, the state DOT, RTD, and even ourselves, Dr. Cog. So if you were to add up all the pieces of that first pie chart on the top, you would look at about $132 billion, but only a small percentage of that's actually available for projects that we include specifically in the plan. So looking at the three specific regional agencies of Dr. Cog, CEDAW, and RTD, the blue portion of each of those is what can be put on projects or programs that we list in the plan. So even though we are looking at about $132 billion out to 2050, only about 15 billion of that can actually be spent on projects and programs that are priorities of the region and locals. And then here's an overview of how that breaks out. Again, we organized the plan and the investments using those six priorities. So you can see how much is going to each of those priorities. Uh, the last one I would note is local projects. So those are projects that are being done completely by local governments or like toll authorities. So there's no uh, federal funding or state funding being included on those projects for inclusion in the plan. But you can see we've specifically made uh, investments in safety, active transportation, air quality investments that in our previous plan, we didn't make so explicitly. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jacob to go through the individual themes and some of the specific projects and outcomes we're hoping to achieve with them. Thank you, Alvin. So these next few slides are gonna be organized around the six themes that Alvin showed. Um, and that's how we've organized the plan based on sort of that consistent input from both the public and stakeholders in our committees um, in terms of some of the important priorities in the region. So let's start with safety. And as we go through these, we'll also do some more Mentimeter polling to get your uh, input and reactions in real time. So for each of these um, six themes, we're first gonna show just a snapshot of a little bit of the data that's in the plan um, to give you a sense of some of the issues around each of the themes. Um, and then we'll talk about what's in the plan to help kind of address some of those issues. So there's a lot of data here on safety. And I think the biggest thing I'd say about safety is obviously, you know, one death on our roadways is one too many. Um, we have a chronic issue with uh, fatalities and serious injuries, both in this region and frankly around the country as well. We're not unique in that sense, but Dr. Cog has committed to an eventual target of zero for fatalities and serious injuries. As many of you know, um, in the last year, uh, we adopted a regional vision zero action plan um, to help us get there. Um, so this is some data just kind of showing our current trends on, on safety. And then this slide gives you um, a sense of what's in the plan to help us start to address safety and help us get to zero. So to orient you here, <clears throat> excuse me, the projects on the left side of the slide are specific safety projects that we've included in the plan. And I will note that we've always had safety projects and these other themes in our plans uh, in our long-range transportation plans. But what's different about the 2050 plan is that we more intentionally actually created a category of projects that are just specifically about safety. And these are the projects that you see listed here. I will note that many other projects in the plan will also benefit uh, safety throughout our region, but we wanted to specifically identify um, a set of safety projects. 
Um, if you look at all those projects on the left side of the screen and then look over on the right, those projects total up to about $465 million in the 2050 plan to these projects dedicated to safety improvements. As I mentioned, that's gonna help us get to that goal of zero, um, vision zero for traffic fatalities and serious injuries. Um, we've also created a programmatic, um, programmatic element in the plan uh, with the idea that, you know, these are some big high profile projects, but we know that there will be other projects identified through the life of the plan. And we wanted to intentionally create a program category in our financial plan to continue um, to identify and invest in safety projects over time, recognizing its priority in this region. So based on that really quick snapshot for the safety theme, um, we're gonna go do some Mentimeter polling again. Um, and as you see here on the screen, we're gonna ask you for each of these themes, two questions. So for safety, how well do you think the 2050 RTP will improve the safety of the regional transportation system based on that brief overview I just gave you? And then how important to you is the issue of safety within the transportation system? So we'll give this just a moment to play out, but um, gratifying to see that yes, indeed, it's a very important issue. We're about 8.6 in terms of the importance um, of safety. Um, and then about 5.7 in the plan for how well you think it will address safety. All right, so let's go to our go. next thing. Uh, uh, yes, before sir. we go on, there was a question in the chat related to safety, like how we're defining that specifically in the plan and these specific projects. Okay, so um, safety, obviously we're talking about safety of the traveling public. So regardless of how you travel, uh, what mode you take, um, you know, whether you're driving or walking or, or riding transit, um, this is really about safety in the transportation system. Alvin, does that answer the, the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So let's go to our next theme, which is active transportation, and just a little bit of a definition here. Active transportation really refers to any way that we move about um, our region without the use of a motor or an engine. So if we're walking, bicycling, rolling, you know, sort of human powered transportation is what we're looking at here. Um, so again, you see some data points. Um, these come from, these are included obviously in the 2015 Regional Transportation Plan draft, but they come from uh, what's known as our active transportation plan, which is a plan that Dr. Cog adopted about a year and a half ago to really dig into uh, these issues of active transportation. Um, you can also see the map on the right that shows our regional active transportation network uh, within, uh, within our overall regional transportation plan. Um, really the point of some of the data here is both to talk about some opportunities about how we travel, that many of our trips are short trips, uh, that maybe there's a potential in the right circumstances and the right infrastructure to have those trips, trips be walking or bicycling trips. And then we also looked at the types of bicyclists in the Denver region. Um, there's some folks who are really comfortable sort of bicycling, regardless of the transportation environment, they'll, they'll bicycle on a busy street. Uh, but I think most of us are in that category where, you know, maybe we're interested if we're able to bicycle, we want to do that. Uh, maybe we don't feel quite as comfortable and we really need the infrastructure and the network to help us be able to do that. Um, so again, in terms of what's in the plan addressing active transportation, um, again, you see a list here of sort of dedicated projects specifically about um, building up that active transportation network. Again, and especially here, I will note that many of the other projects in the plan, and we'll get to that in a couple of slides, will also help our active transportation network and address walking and bicycling in the region. Uh, but again, we wanted to identify a set of projects that were specifically um, dedicated towards uh, walking and bicycling and other forms of active transportation. So the projects that you see here on the left around the region uh, total up to about $180 million uh, in the plan. Um, but again, we've also created a programmatic category. We wanted to be intentional about saying this is a priority. So we want to set aside dollars in our financial plan that over time we can continue uh, to identify additional active transportation projects. Um, so we've set aside about $31 million in our financial plan to be able to do that. And then, you know, based on all these things together, we think this will add about 154 miles of new regional trails to our active transportation network. 
So again, based on that sort of quick overview of drinking from a fire hydrant, we again want to ask you through the Mentimeter polling, how well do you think the 2050 RTP will improve active transportation within our region? And how important to you is the issue of active transportation? So we'll give this a moment to populate. So clearly based on these results coming in, um, obviously the issue is very important and that's gratifying to hear that we're sort of hitting our marks on what are the important issues in the region, about an 8.4 for this issue. And then in terms of how well you think the plan would, would address active transportation, we're close to six, about a 5.8. So let's go to the next theme of air quality, obviously a hugely important issue. Um, so here's some data on this slide uh, about air quality, and this really encompasses a lot of things. It's everything uh, related to electric vehicles, uh, the federal standards that we need to meet for um, um, ozone standards in the region, criteria pollutants that we, um, you know, that we uh, model in this region and, and have emissions budgets, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a lot that goes into this, and really the strategy and the plan is a little bit of all of the above. The idea here is that we wanted to include projects in the plan, you know, multimodal projects, transit projects, safety projects that help over time uh, with our air quality. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time in this plan talking about sort of the future in terms of things like electric vehicles, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Alvin talked about Hospital 1261, uh, Colorado's climate action plan and greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, we talk about that in the plan. And as that continues to be implemented, we will continue to uh, amend and update this plan to sort of reflect that because there will be a large role for this regional transportation plan in helping this region meet uh, the objectives and the targets within House Bill 1261. The other thing I'd point out on this slide is this is also one of our big federal requirements as it shows at the bottom of the slide. The plan, uh, the federal requirements here for the plan are really about um, not individual projects per se because when those individual projects are implemented they have their own requirements but for a regional transportation plan we have to demonstrate that the network, the system of the projects within this plan collectively uh, will help us meet what are known as our emissions budgets tests. And those are set for us by the state. Um, and as this slide indicates that we have done the air quality, what's known as the air quality conformity modeling for this plan. Um, and yes, this plan will meet uh, our current emissions budget test. Um, so again, another, another polling question similar to the first two. Uh, based on that quick overview, how well do you think the 2050 RTP will help improve air quality in the region and how important to you is air quality? And then Jacob, while we're on this topic, we received a question. If you could elaborate what the goals are in House Bill 1261 that we know, what are those emission reduction? Yeah, so what I know of House Bill 1261, it's still being implemented, but very, very aggressive goals around um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and a lot of strategies to help us get there um, those targets, those specific targets are being set, um, I think pretty much as we speak, um, but over time as those are identified, one of the big roles for the regional transportation plan will be to demonstrate how the projects in the plan and how the plan itself helps this region meet um, those targets for greenhouse gas emission reduction once they're set. So as we look at the uh, results here again, um, obviously air quality is a very important issue, 9.4. Um, and then how well do you think the plan will address it, uh, 4.2. So let's talk about our next topic, which is multimodal mobility. Um, kind of a big overarching topic. So a little bit of explanation here as we get to the next slide. Um, so first, some kind of just data about how is the region's uh, transportation system being used? You know, what modes are we taking on a, on a typical weekday? How do we travel about our region? And then over on the right, um, this talks about our average daily, what's known as vehicle miles of travel. You know, how much are we traveling regardless of mode uh, within this region? Um, and I do want to explain this one a little bit, and I think I saw a question in the chat about it. Um, we track a couple things here. We track overall vehicle miles of travel for the, for the entire region. Um, and that's the blue line at the top on the right. We see about 84.3 million daily VMT, as it's known in this region. And then we also, we also track what's known as vehicle miles traveled per person. 
Um, and the idea here is that, you know, as Alvin indicated, our region is a growing region. We're gonna add just over a million people in the next 30 years. Um, we do expect, you know, frankly, that our vehicle miles of travel overall will increase over time as our region grows. But one of our targets at Dr. Cog uh, within our overall Metro Vision plan is the notion, can we start decreasing our vehicle miles of travel per capita? Uh, can we give people travel options, other ways to travel, teleworking, things that we, you know, things that we can uh, do to help bring down the amount of travel per person? And that's the purple uh, line at the bottom of this graph. And that has gone up and down um, over time. We have been able to start to bend the curve a little bit on that, but obviously, you know, more to do there. So when we talk about multimodal mobility, that's kind of a, a catchphrase for the notion that. Um, you know, given the limited funding that, that this region has, that frankly the country has for transportation, uh, but particularly in this region, you know, we want to select, quote unquote, the best projects for this plan. We want to select projects that, you know, will help, um, help with multiple outcomes, help us achieve multiple bottom lines, um, so that even, for example, roadway projects, of which there are several in the plan, are projects that, you know, will be multimodal in nature when they're implemented uh, when they're designed and implemented such that, you know, even if it's a roadway project, it will have walking and bicycling facilities, it'll have uh, transit infrastructure. Um, and that was something that we really stressed throughout the project development process is really looking for these multimodal projects. We also wanted projects that would do multiple things for us in terms of, you know, maybe a transit project is also a safety project. Maybe a safety project helps us with air quality. So we were really looking for those multiple outcomes um, as we were looking through these projects. So what you see on this slide on the left is a partial list of some of the projects in this plan um, around multimodal mobility. Um, and over on the right, um, you see some data that I'll go through really quickly. We did a comparison of you know, what would happen in 2050 with the investments in this plan compared to sort of a trend um, analysis. What would happen with 2050 business as usual if we didn't have the 2050 regional transportation plan? So we think based on that modeling work that there would be almost 13,000 fewer driver trips um, with the plan as envisioned and without the plan. And we think we'd see about a 25% improvement in congested vehicle travel uh, with the plan compared to without the plan. Um, and then bottom line here is we're investing about $7.5 billion in 68 multimodal projects and programs uh, within the regional transportation plan. So again, um, you know, same approach as some of these other themes. How well do you think the 2050 RTP will improve multimodal mobility of the regional transportation system and how important to you is the issue of multimodal mobility. So as we give that a moment to populate, Alvin, I've seen some questions come in. I don't know if they're applicable to this topic. Yeah, I was gonna mention a couple of them. Um, related to multimodal mobility, looking at some of the specific projects and how they're widening, um, how are they also addressing other topics related to transit or safety or active transportation? Specifically one question on like the Pena project as an example. Yeah, so let me talk generally uh, about that first really quickly. Um, again, as we were going through the project identification and evaluation process is what we called it uh, with our stakeholders and, and with our public around the region, you know, we did stress very strongly that we wanted these projects to be um, as multimodal as possible. Understand that in a 30 year plan, a lot of these projects are conceptual. They're 10 or 20 or even 25 years away from, from being implemented. So at this stage, you know, they are very conceptual in nature. Um, but again, we, you know, we really emphasize that in these candidate projects, as they were known, you know, projects submitted for consideration for inclusion in the plan, uh, we really wanted to see those multimodal elements. And that's how we evaluated these projects in part um, as we put together the project list that ended up being in the plan. There's also several other tools in the plan to help us get to that vision. Um, I'll mention one really quickly in particular, which is the notion of what we call complete streets and street typologies. And without getting too much into that, it's the notion that you know, these projects are conceptual in nature, as I said at this stage, but you know, what happens at the time when a local government is ready to implement a project? You know, what does that project look like? How is it designed? How do we ensure that it can be as multimodal and as much of a complete street as possible and that it really reflects the function of that particular roadway and the land use environment and the community character in which that roadway is located. And that's really what some of those tools in the plan um, are meant to help us and help our local governments do um, to give us those tools and resources to really implement and fund the best, best projects possible. Um, I don't wanna pick on any particular project, but since we were asked about the Pena project and I do wanna give credit to the city of Denver and to Denver International Airport, we actually worked with them on that project to have that be a managed lane uh, project. 
Um, and frankly, the other freeway and interstate projects in this plan are also um, have that managed lane component. Um, again, we do have needs in our freeway system, um, but we wanted to even there make those projects as multimodal as possible um, to use the managed lane approach. Some of those segments also have multimodal mobility hubs um, as part of them as well. Um, so looking at the results here for multimodal mobility, again, it's an important issue to folks, about 8.5. Um, and about 5.3 for the score here of how well we think the plan might address multimodal mobility. So I think we have two more. Um, let's talk about freight. Freight is a topic that's maybe not quite as top of mind as some of these other topics we've been talking about. Um, but it, you know, especially through the pandemic, I think we all have the shared experience of you know, package deliveries, grocery delivery, food delivery. Um, so we know that the movement of freight, uh, goods and freight, uh, goods and services um, in, in, you know, in freight movement in our region is, is really important. Um, and it's something that was identified in our public and stakeholder engagement as an important topic. So just a couple data points here. Um, some people know this and some people don't. Most of the freight that moves through our region and moves through Colorado is actually moved uh, by truck. And you can see those statistics on the upper left, uh, whether we look at the tonnage um, of goods moved or the dollar value of goods moved. Most of it is by truck. Um, and over on the bottom right, you can see that trucks carry over 90% of total goods uh, by tonnage within our region. Um, you also see in the lower right, there's about 574 freight railroad roadway crossings in our region. So in terms of what's in the plan for freight, um, again, there's a few sort of specific freight projects. Although again, I will note that many of the projects in the plan and other categories will also help with freight and goods movement. But we did particularly want to identify a few uh, freight specific projects to include in the plan. Um, it's about $220 million in uh, projects specifically dedicated to freight in the 2050 plan. And we also created a program of about $76 million. Again, because this is a priority like some of the priorities we've been discussing, we wanted to intentionally create a program to identify uh, future freight projects over the life of this plan. And in implementing this plan, we think there'll be about 20% fewer vehicle hours of delay forecast with this plan compared to a future trend without the investments in the 2050 plan. And I'll mention as we get into this next exercise that a lot of these like safety and active transportation freight is the same as well that, you know, both Dr. Cog and CDOT recently adopted multimodal freight plans. So part of the strategy in the 2050 plan is to help implement that planning work that's been done either by Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD or our local governments. So with that, again, same question, how well do you think the 2050 RTP will improve freight movement in the region and how important to you is the issue of freight? So we'll give this a second, but not surprising that the freight issue is maybe a little less important. Um, that's consistent with what we've seen in other, um, other meetings that we've asked this question at. Um, so about a 6.7 so far in terms of how important it is and about a six in terms of how well you think the plan uh, addresses the issue of freight. Um, Alvin, have we gotten any freight specific uh, questions in the chat? No, not yet. Okay. All right, so let's go to our last sort of major theme topic, which is regional transit. Um, there's a lot on this topic, so I'll try and summarize what's in the plan um, addressing transit. Um, first, again, some data um, over on the far left. Um, how does the region's transit system, how does the transit system serve the region's residents? So you can just see some basic statistics about um, transit um, in our region, uh, bus, light rail, and commuter rail. In the middle of this slide is sort of a sense of the different types of transit that we have in this region. Um, again, similar to the other themes we've been discussing, um, also included in the 2050 plan is a specific transit plan. It's called the Coordinated Transit Plan. Um, and it's something that goes into great depth about um, all the different types of transit we have in the region, how people use transit, uh, what are the needs, priorities, issues, challenges, and opportunities for transit in this region, um, and what are, you know, what, are some, what are some priorities that we should be uh, looking at and invest, investing in, uh, in terms of transit as we go forward. Um, so that's one of the appendices in the plan, but a very deep dive um, on some of the transit issues. Um, again, as you see here, whether it's, you know, the local bus that we might ride on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether it's commuter rail or some of the fast tracks elements, or whether it's what we call human service transportation, uh, trans uh, transit for vulnerable populations as well. And then over on the right, you see a map that's included in chapter three of the plan that really shows our overall transit vision uh, through 2050. Um, so this includes um, bus rapid transit, it includes front range rail, 
um, and includes other elements of that sort of funded and vision uh, transit network that we envision for this region by 2050. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. So a lot of investments in the plan on transit. Um, in the financial plan, there's uh, sort of the day-to-day -day investments for RTD primarily, you know, what it takes to operate and maintain um, our existing transit network. And looking towards the future, we've identified, um, you know, Fast Tracks um, has been in our plan for a very long period of time um, based on input from RTD. The top project there on the left is the Northwest Rail uh, Peak Period Service Plan. Um, RTD felt like they could include um, at least that component of unfinished fast tracks in the plan, recognizing that they've been engaged in their reimagined RTD process, which will be continuing and will provide more definition um, on fast tracks in the future. Um, another thing that RTD has done um, that many of you are aware of is they prepared something called the RTD Regional Bus Rapid Transit Feasibility Study, uh, which resulted in a network of corridors uh, for bus rapid transit or BRT to be implemented over time. We see the 2050 plan as a key opportunity to do that. So a lot of these projects that you see on the left side of this slide, uh, we've actually identified a bus rapid transit network of approximately eight to 10 corridors across our region uh, to start implementing uh, that bus rapid transit network. We've also identified what we're calling transit planning corridors across our region. State Highway 7 is one example um, where we recognize that maybe you know, there's, some, there's a great need and a great priority for transit investment in those corridors, uh, but there's also a need to further develop the unique transit vision uh, for those corridors. So the plan envisions uh, planning investment, project development, and financial investment to further develop uh, the transit vision in those corridors around the region. Um, so when you put that all together, um, you can see over on the right, uh, about 374,000 transit trips are forecast in 2050, which is an increase of 229,000 from 2020. Um, we also look at uh, sort of transit jobs access. So the idea that 60% of people in 2015 are forecast to have good access to jobs via public transit. And specifically when we get into issues of equity and environmental justice, which is a really important part of this plan. And this is partly where that shows up. 78% of people in low, low income and minority areas in 2050 are forecast to have good access to jobs via public transit. So when you look at those investments altogether, it's approximately 2.7 billion invested in 20 specific transit projects, 146 miles of new bus rapid transit uh, lineage or bus, bus rapid transit projects, and 10% higher transit ridership compared to a future trend without these investments in the 2050 plan. So that was a lot, but again, the same question, how well do you think the 2050 RTP will improve regional transit and how important to you is the topic of regional transit? And as that's populating, um, Alvin, again, I'll ask, is there, are there any questions related to regional transit? Yep, there's one that came in. Uh, if you could discuss how uh, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, how their funding goes into the transit projects that we're outlining. Yeah, so we really work together with uh, the three agencies work together uh, to really look at holistically, you know, what funding sources are available uh, to invest in some of the transit uh, projects and investments that I just went over. So in a nutshell, without getting overly complicated, there are a series of federal and state funds, um, sometimes that are dedicated to transit, they're transit specific, other funds that can be used on transit. Uh, so we work together to identify a variety of those funds, uh, whether it's uh, funds that come from the Federal Transit Administration, um, there's some funding at the state level called Faster Transit, um, and a few other funds that we put together. Um, and obviously RTD uh, with their uh, sales and use tax, both for their existing system and then the dedicated sales and use tax for fast tracks. So there's a lot of different uh, funding sources that we put together to try and uh, fund and, and sort of create this transit network that's in the plan. It's Jacob. And then there was one question on um, funding within a project. So uh, knowing that there might be a road project or a transit project, uh, if there's a safety component, can there be, can it use safety funding specifically? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it really depends on both the parameters of the funding source in question, the eligibility of that funding source and the specifics of a particular project. But um, in general terms, sometimes yes, depending on the nature of the project, different types of funds can be used uh, to contribute towards the funding of that project. Um, so looking at the poll results here, how important to use regional transit, about 8.2, and then how well do you think the plan will improve regional transit, uh, about 
So I know we've had, as I said before, kind of a drink from a fire hydrant in terms of uh, what's in a plan that has 180 pages and 19 appendices. There, there is an awful lot. Uh, we've talked about some of the highlights. I'm not going to go through everything on this slide in, in great detail, um, but you can see many of the different topics that are also um, included in the plan, whether it's in the main four chapters of the plan or a particular appendix um, that addresses a particular issue. Um, but we've gotten questions as we've gone through meetings like this where somebody says, what about, you know, what about technology or what about performance measurement or how are you documenting air quality? Um, chances are it's either in the main document or uh, there's an appendix uh, dedicated to that particular topic. So this gives you a sense of all the variety of things that's in a long range multimodal transportation plan. All right, and with that, we're going to actually go to some more general questions back to that polling just to draw out a bit more um, kind of less specific about the different topics, but more general, um, you know, thinking that everybody, everybody has an idea of what their ideal transportation system is and everybody's is different from from each other. So uh, thinking about 2050, thinking forward 30 years and what you've heard today, or if you were able to explore the plan before this meeting. How well does the plan align with your ideal transportation system? So radio, not so well, not at all well, very well, somewhat well. Just trying to get, get an idea. Like we got a mix, um, quite a few somewhat wells, not so well, not at all well, and a few very wells, a little bit of everything. All right, so I'd like to draw out a little bit more about that. Um, Here's some more details. We'll kind of jump into the Q&A and discussion question once we're done with these polling questions, but um, we have a few open-ended um, questions where you can add a little, a bit more detail about why you answered the way that you did. So the first one is, in what areas does the plan least align with your ideal transportation system? What did you hear um, that maybe wasn't in line with what you think, where you think the Denver region should be by 2050? And you can just type that in the same way that you typed in um, what state or country you're from, and it'll pop up on the screen. And that's um, that can start discussion uh, just to try to hear a bit more about that. All right, first one coming in, too much emphasis on roadway expansion projects. Mixed commutes. We, road and highway expansion. That's certainly in line with what um, sentiments we've heard. We'd like to see more money allocated to multimodal safety, specifically bike and pedestrian. Millions of dollars going to multimodal projects that are really just roadway expansions. Spend significantly less money on vehicle tra traffic and more on everything else. Reduction of greenhouse gases and dependence on auto transportation moving freight instead of the emphasis on local pickup areas, moving freight through the region, finance does not meet the needs, mass transit, missed South Metro cities and some geographic based questions, BMT, vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases will drastically increase with roadway expansions. So kind of hearing a trend about the roadway expansions and their impact on greenhouse gases and a more emphasis on safety for vulnerable users, more, more funding for bike and pedestrian safety and transit. Electric vehicles and the impact on vehicle miles traveled, induced demand related to those wider roadways, remediating harm by highways in minority communities and the safety improvements um, having multiple impacts. All right, I think that gives us a good idea. We're gonna kind of do the flip of that question. So in what ways does the plan most align with your ideal sy transportation system? What did you hear in this presentation or if you explored the plan before that you were excited to see and that you're glad that uh, the region is starting to think about or is thinking more about um, moving forward to 2050? Less rapid transit, significant emphasis on that for the, the regional transit part. Love the inclusion of environmental and equity analysis in the plan. 
multimodal plan, so they need more funding. Like the performance measures, that's a great way that we weren't able to touch on it, but it's how we track our progress on all of these things. Vision Zero, the safety, the safety program of trying to get to zero fatalities on our roads. The emphasis on safety and bus rapid transit investments. The constant focus on multimodal, multimodality throughout the plan. Having those multiple modes of transportation from the same infrastructure. Another one for Vision Zero. Great to see. Focus on active transportation and multimodal options, BRT, emphasis on safety. The emphasis on developing a regional BRT system. So lots of, lots of comments about the BRT, the bus rapid transit. Needing to review individual projects more closely, but at a high level, the repeated bus rapid transit references. That's great. And the um, interactive map is really great for actually zooming in and seeing all the details about each one of these projects. And I'll talk about that and how you can find that a bit more later. Projects that achieve multiple goals, emphasis on active transportation. All right, so that's our last Mentimeter question. Um, I'll leave that up so you can still type it in um, however you're doing that if you want to add more, but I will jump back to these slides. Um, really, I just wanna open it up now to our more general discussion. Um, so feel free to either, you can either raise your hand, raise your virtual hand, um, and I will see you and call on you and you can um, unmute yourself and ask your question specifically, or you can just throw your question in the chat and Alvin will kind of moderate those and read those as those come up. So yeah, this is really the open time. This is what we want. We wanna answer your question. So uh, let us know. All right, looks like David Mincer has his hand up. David, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking the time today. Um, what, one general question, I'm, I'm looking at the table of projects and the largest project, the largest uh, subset is the multimodal capital projects. So I think if you ask the average Coloradan what is a multimodal project, they wouldn't say a 60 million highway interchange or widening the state highway from two lanes to four lanes. That's just not multi multimodal, it's not doesn't seem to fulfill any of the criteria that you laid out at the beginning, but that's the majority of these projects. So uh, I'm you know, just hoping that you would really revisit this um, and really try, you know, if, we, if the ratios were reversed, we could actually reduce VMT, not just per capita VMT. So that's, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thanks, David. Jacob, do you want to address that? Yeah, no, I appreciate that feedback and feed, feedback. <laughs> um, and again, um, it, you know, this plan is conceptual and what's important is, and, and I'll acknowledge that the descriptions in the table, you know, they're truncated so that we can put them in the table. Um, but as these projects get implemented, again, that's really where the emphasis is on um, over time as these projects get developed and they get defined and they get designed and they get implemented, you know, we're wanting to put tools in place to ensure that these projects really meet their fullest potential that's appropriate for the local context of um, you know, where they're located and what their function is. So we hear you on that. Um, but again, um, it's something that we did try to emphasize you know, with our stakeholders, with project sponsors, as we were identifying, evaluating these projects and we will continue that emphasis um, as we all work together to implement this plan. Great. We do have a question in the chat. Uh, Jacob, if you could discuss how autonomous vehicles are addressed in the plan. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in a nutshell, one of the many, many pieces of this plan is an appendix uh, devoted to this whole notion of um, technology and transportation. Um, and it's called the Mobility Choice Blueprint. It's a piece of work that we did um, a couple of years ago in collaboration with CDOT, RTD, and the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce. And it was a pretty wide ranging look at you know, how rapidly technology is evolving in terms of how it affects transportation. You know, we all think of autonomous vehicles, which are known as driverless cars and drones and all these sorts of things. Um, and there's a lot of things sort of in between before we get to that. Um, but, you know, what are these things that are coming? How is the field changing? And how can this region start to um, start to respond to that and start to address that? Um, so without going in, into it in much more detail, um, there's a lot of information in the plan that really talks about those issues. And based on that planning work, Dr. Cog and our partners uh, have implemented some programmatic um, programmatic work that um, continues something known the Advanced Mobility Partnership, uh, where we meet monthly 
uh, to get together to really talk about those issues and identify some specific implementable actions um, around these issues of technology and mobility. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, it looks like Amy has her hand up. Hi, um, I heard that um, Pete Buttigieg um, recently said a couple of times in public that this new administration believes that um, cities or communities should be able to stop highway projects like highway expansions that are displacing people's um, homes if they don't want the project, no matter if it's been going on for a while or not. Um, could you guys talk about like how the new federal administration might affect this plan that you're working on? Yeah, that's a good question. The honest answer that I can give you at this point is we don't know yet. Um, there's a lot in flux at the federal level in terms of uh, funding, whether that's sort of COVID stimulus, infrastructure funding, um, sort of future funding. There's a federal, without getting too wonky here, there's uh, federal requirements that we need to meet and, and CDOT and RTD need to meet um, that's contained in a what's known as a federal surface transportation bill. Uh, the one we have now is called the FAST Act, for those that are familiar with it. Um, that bill is up for reauthorization. It was extended for a year, uh, but it needs to be reauthorized. And every time a major federal reauthorization happens, you know, sometimes there can be you know, small changes and big changes um, in those requirements. So bottom line here is that you know, there's a lot to be determined and we just, we just don't know. What we're trying to do in this plan is to be um, as multimodal, as flexible, as pragmatic as possible um, to take advantage of the future as it unfolds. I couldn't write down fast enough the, the bill that you said. Is that a federal or state bill? It's a federal bill. It's known as the FAST Act. It's the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act um, is what it's formally called. And that's the, that's the federal authorization bill that we've had in place uh, for the last several years. Uh, so sorry to go too fast there. What I said is that uh, too fast about the FAST Act. Um, that act was extended for another year uh, recently, but it's up for reauthorization. So when that extension is done, it needs to be reauthorized. And when a big bill like that is reauthorized is when we often see a lot of change that could happen. So it's to be determined. Great, we have another hand up from David. Oh, David, you'll have to unmute. There you this go. is really a question for Jacob. And Jacob, I think that in meetings we've both been in, I've mentioned this even if obliquely before, and it has to do with human service transportation. In a sense, the assumption there with human service transportation is for those people who can't get around by themselves and who need assistance, like with you know, paratransit or any other sort of mobility services, about the most society can provide them is human service transportation not the full range of transportation that all of us enjoy when we can hop on a bike or walk or get behind a single, the wheel of a single occupant vehicle car. So my comment to you is, as our expectations rise and as Americans feel a little more entitled to a larger range of mobility services when they're unable to get around themselves uh, simply because expectations have risen, I would like to encourage the plan to put a little more attention into this, even if you don't have answers and even if you just identify it and raise some questions. And partly I say this because uh, when we did a study in Jeffco a few years ago, we found there's a significant unmet demand for mobility services. And there's simply insufficient supply and insufficient money for it. And so when we're talking, looking ahead a generation, I think there ought to be a little more attention to this in the plan. Yeah, thanks Dave, I really appreciate those comments. Um, I think Dave's, Dave knows some of this, but just for general sort of uh, consumption around that issue, We've done a lot of work both at Dr. Cog and with our stakeholders over the last several years to really break down and combine some of those funding silos um, around human service transportation. It's a very complicated arena, um, as Dave knows really well, in terms of the funding that's available and who administers it and who's eligible for trips um, and inefficiencies in that whole system. And we've worked really hard 
um, to combine those funding sources. Um, we created in our transportation improvement program, which is our short range plan for funding specific projects, we actually created um, a program for human service transportation to help integrate federal, state, um, and now regional dollars for human service transportation to try and get more service out there, more trips in, in the region um, and serve more people. So there's more work to do for sure, um, but this has been a priority for Dr. Cargo over the last several years. That work is described in the coordinated transit plan. Um, and Dave, you're right, there's even more to do and it's an issue that is a priority for us and that we will continue to focus on, particularly as our region continues to age, uh, which is something else we look at in this plan. You know, as our region gets older, we will all need more of those transportation options for sure. Thanks, Jacob. Alvin, are there questions in the chat? Yeah, some some have come through. Uh, one of the first ones we can go at, look at is uh, there are a lot of large scale regional transit projects included in the plan. Uh, if we could discuss those difficulties uh, with coordinating across multiple partners, multiple counties, multiple municipalities or agencies and how we address that. Yeah, thanks, Alvin. Um, so I sort of, you know, started hinting at that already in my answer to Dave, but, you know, just in a nutshell, um, there's several, you know, several agencies involved in um, human service transportation, really all forms of transportation in this region. Um, and one of the things we've tried to do specifically around transit, again, is to work with our partners, um, you know, RTD, CDOT, local governments and others, uh, transit providers like Via Mobility, um, you know, to really break down some of those silos, combine some of these funding sources together, um, so that again, we can get more trips out there. We can be a little bit more efficient, um, you know, with those funding resources. Um, we've also um, been working for several years on a project that's known as the Ride Alliance, and that's that's a technology piece. Um, so when someone asked about technology, you know, here's an application of it where um, bringing technology into uh, the scheduling and the provision of human service transportation trips, creating you know what's known as a trip exchange or a hub, so that. We can be more efficient. You know, if I need a trip, I live in Jefferson County, for example, if I need a trip to go somewhere um, and one provider can't do it on a particular day, but maybe another provider can, you know, those trips can be traded. Uh, my trip can be combined with other trips so that it becomes a little bit more efficient, less expensive to provide that trip. So that's one example, but there's many things like that that we've been working on and others have been working on for a long period of time. Um, again, to try and provide more trips, meet the need that's out there, um, get more service out there and, and um, you know, help people connect with um, the things that they need in their lives um, in terms of uh, providing human service transportation. Thanks, Jacob. Um, if you could discuss the freight improvements that aren't mentioned in our plan, so maybe those that are being handled by private operators, how do we sure. uh, take those into account? Yeah, um, and you know, sort of a truism on the plan in general is that given the, given the size of our region, um, the scope of our region, the scope of the plan, um, and given some you know, requirements around our plan, we don't attempt to identify every single project that's gonna take place in this region over the next 30 years. We do identify some of these major projects that uh, we spent time in this presentation going through, but you know, recognize that there are a lot of like, for example, local bus service, local sidewalk, intersection maintenance type projects that um, you know, we're sort of smaller scale and we wouldn't attempt to list, you know, hundreds and hundreds of projects in the plan. Um, but we know that those projects will be developed and implemented over time. Um, and that applies to freight a little bit. So yes, we have those few kind of bigger, uh, bigger freight projects in the plan. Um, within our multimodal freight plan that we've developed, um, that's one of the appendices of this plan, we've identified a priority freight network um, to help guide future freight planning efforts. We've identified that programmatic element to help identify some of those future projects over time. Um, but there is a recognition that over time as this plan is implemented, a local government may identify, for example, a um, improving a railroad crossing um, or improving um, sort of something related to truck travel um, in a particular area um, that again is you know, maybe too small to identify as a specific project in this plan right now, um, but will be identified through either the programmatic element over time or will be identified through um, other means and implemented through our transportation improvement program. Thanks. And then the last one that came in is related to a couple that we've gotten previously about changing the plan. So uh, related to maybe House Bill 1261 or the reauthorization for a new federal surface transportation bill, uh, how we change the plan between our four-year update cycles. Yeah, that's a great question. So. 
We do have a federal requirement that we need to do a major update to this plan every four years, and that's what we're engaged in now. Our current plan is a 2040 plan that was adopted in 2017. This will be our 2050 plan. In between those major four-year updates, we amend the plan sort of on a more regular basis, approximately about once every year, um, because we know that things change over time. Every plan is a snapshot in time and things continue to change um, and evolve. So we do amend the plan uh, frequently to sort of keep up with that between major updates. In chapter three of this plan, we do acknowledge that there are some big picture things out there that will also act to, you know, sort of amend this plan over time. House Bill 1261 is one of those. Reimagine RTD is another one of those. Um, so we recognize that, you know, we incorporate um, and include as much as we possibly can when we're putting the plan together. But as things are always changing and always evolving, uh, we know that we'll need to amend the plan uh, somewhat over time as we go. What was really important to us in this planning process is that when it comes to these major projects and these major priorities that we've spent time talking about today, we wanna to get those right. We especially wanna get those right over the first 10 years or so of this 30 year plan. We ought to know over the next few years what those major project priorities are. Things that are more in the future, that are more conceptual, yeah, those will continue to change. But as we look to the next you know, one to five to 10 years, you know, we hope we've gotten those right because we really wanna focus on implementing those priority projects and programs. Jacob, that's all for the chat right now. All right, does anybody else have a question that they wanna raise their hand and say the question out loud or feel free to throw a question in the chat or just a comment? All right, well, we have just a couple final slides. We may, may end the meeting a bit early, but feel free if you do have questions, interrupt me, please raise your hand, um, put your question in the chat again. Um, but I will just go through, or we'll just kind of wrap up talking about all the input opportunities again. And I wanna show you the virtual open house that we've developed. All right, so you've seen this slide before. We really need to hear the public input at this point. We are in the draft plan review. This is a really important part of the overall planning process. We've spent almost two years developing this plan. We started back in the summer of 2019 with in-person events, which I miss dearly, um, talking to people about their vision for transportation in 2050. And we wanna make sure that this plan is reflecting what the public um, wants for their transportation system in 2050. So. Uh, this is really our big opportunity right now to hear whether we got it right, whether we have um, things that we should change between this draft and final version of the plan. And that's where I really would like your help, like I said before, to share, um, share this information with people you know who are interested in transportation, who may not know that there is a regional transportation plan. Um, please do share it far and wide. We want to get as many eyes as possible on this plan to make sure that it really reflects the needs and priorities of the people who live in the Denver region. So we have all these options, like I said, we have this open house, the meetings, the, um, the public hearing, and I just wanna show you kind of a, a demo, I guess, of our virtual open house. This is something that we, we, this is the first time we've done this and it's we did it for the specific reason of being in a pandemic and trying to provide some different options and also understanding that, um, a lot of people have Zoom fatigue and might not want to join a live public meeting, or maybe the time just wasn't right for them to join us today or at some of our other meetings. So I just want to show you all the ways that um, you can engage with this virtual open house or others can engage. So we developed basically as much detail as you'd like to get into or as interested as you are in the plan, that's what you can do on this site. So you can either be the kind of person that um, wants to read the full plan, the 180 pages and all the appendices, or if you just want to read, I see Dave shaking his head. <laughs> Dave's not that person. <laughs> but um, there's also a one page overview. There's an executive summary that's a few pages. You can dive into the different chapters. We've mentioned the interactive project map. I just want to give you kind of an idea of what that looks like. So that's an interactive web map that you can zoom in and look at all these projects that we've talked about and the staging periods and um, project costs and things like that and how those align with those different priorities that we've talked about today. There's also um, a way that you can just explore the plan by topic. So that's really revolving around those six main topics that we focused on today. Um, and what it does is, um, pulling up, 
it will it it gives you kind of a very similar to what we've seen in the um, in the slides today, where it gives you a summary of the current conditions for each of those topics and um, some of those data points that Jacob talked about, and then kind of those highlights of the funding and the outcomes based on that topic. And then there's a short little survey that people can take, um, very almost identical to what you did with the Mentimeter polling, and then just options for general comments. On that previous page that I showed you, there's also a way for people to view the exact plan and mark it up directly. So if you want to really point at a map and say your comment specifically to that, you can also do that as well. So there's lots of different ways. Um, we are so grateful that you joined us today for this meeting, and it's been great to get to talk to you all directly. Um, but if you feel like you want to provide more input, there's certainly lots of options for you to do that. And we'd love to hear more from you and hear more about what you think about the plan. So with that, I think I'll close our meeting. Um, Jacob, Alvin, and I will stick around if you guys just want to chat or feel free to enjoy the rest of your day before, before the snow falls. So thanks again for coming. Really appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Great job, Lisa, and Jacob, and Alvin, and everyone. Thank you.